This is Health Day. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Mabel Jong. The nation's schools are finishing up the spring term and looking ahead to the fall. Will schools reopen? And how? A CDC checklist included guidelines from daily temperature checks for staff and students to staggering arrival and dismissal times. But what else is needed to keep kids and their families safe during the pandemic? I'm joined now by two experts, Dan Domenech and also Dr. Dimitri Christakis, pediatrician, epidemiologist, and director for the Seattle Children's Research Institute. Gentlemen, thank you to you both. Pleasure to be here. Glad to be here. Thank you so much. It's so great to see the both of you. Um, let's start with you first, Dan. Um, these guidelines that were issued by the CDC when looking at them, what are the ones you believe you're really going to be recommending to your membership for the fall? Well, we actually uh, were very happy to see that the CDC finally uh, came out with some very specific uh, guidelines. The initial guidelines that came out were basically not really telling us what we needed to know. Uh, so we're very happy with those guidelines and they're very specific and all of our superintendents are now and we have as an association basically uh, adopted the CDC guidelines uh, as the criteria uh, mm -hmm. for uh, school districts to use in making uh, decisions to open. Okay. Now having said that there's no question but uh, that the guidelines are going to present some difficulty in implementing uh, both from a practical sense, for example, uh, how do you keep face masks on kids that are in first, second, or third grade, or even kindergarten? Right. Uh, how do you keep kids uh, apart six feet uh, as it's being recommended? So there's a number of issues there uh, practically that are going to be difficult to implement, but also a major cost factor. And that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's the biggest concern and impediment we see right now. Uh, mm -hmm that school districts that are already gonna be suffering financially because of the economy uh, are not, may not be able to have the dollars that they will need uh, to implement the guidelines as they should be implemented. Now, have you perhaps heard from teachers that are nervous? Um, we, well, from what we know, we, we know that teachers sometimes catch the cold or the flu from the students that they teach. Not sometimes. Are they about coming back? all the time not sometimes <laughs> okay yeah so what about this coronavirus then yeah so yes absolutely and we already heard from quite a few teachers uh who are older and who have uh, medical issues saying that uh, they don't plan to come back uh, they don't want to take the risk of being in an environment that's going to make them sick so that's another issue uh, that superintendents are going to have to deal with the possible loss of key personnel okay now Moving over to you, Dr. Christakis, um, there are a lot of risks associated with a fall reopening, but you believe those will, supersede, will be superseded by the fact that kids need to get back into the classroom, right? Well, let's start by trying to give people some perspective on what the risks to their child actually are, because that's, that's the first level, right? Parents are worried their child will get sick. So if a child gets COVID, there's a one in 1,000 chance that they will be hospitalized with it, one in the thousand. And there is a one in 100,000 chance that they will die from it. Hmm. Those, are, those are long odds, as they say, right? Your child's risk of getting hit by lightning over the course of their lifetime is one in 15,000, to give some perspective. Okay. So we know that. We know that children themselves are at very low risk of getting sick uh, with COVID. We don't know um, how big a risk they pose to uh, pass COVID on to either teachers or uh, family members. It's unfortunate we don't know that because that would make our decision-making a lot easier. We don't know how contagious they actually are. Some studies suggest that they are as contagious as adults, and some studies suggest that they're less contagious than adults. Whatever we do when kids go back to school, we need to answer that question. We need to have research in place to figure out what role children play in transmission. Okay. But here's the other part of it. 
we talk a lot about the risks of children going to school. We don't talk enough, in my opinion, about the risks of children not going to school, particularly primary school kids for whom distance learning, frankly, is ineffective. I don't think any teacher, any parent, any child development expert such as myself would believe that a kindergartner or a first grader or a second grader can learn through distance learning. And that's just the learning part, not the social part, which the social emotional development of children is also vitally important, particularly for young children. And they're not getting any of that over Zoom. Okay, so what about learning loss and distance learning? I mean, we have a lot of really great tools now available to teachers and to students. Have we seen that being effective at all in stemming some of the challenges that kids face not being able to see their teacher in person. Well, let, let me say, oh. you want, well uh, go ahead, Dr. Christakis, and we'll get back to you, Dan, on that question too. Sure. Sorry. No, it's okay. I first, I wanna commend the heroic efforts that schools and teachers have done to prepare for something that no one foresaw and that had never been done before. So it's, it's very difficult to be critical of something that people had to put together on the fly as, as, as all school districts had to do. Um, I think there, it's been a learning experience and I think some school districts have done better than others. Um, but, but the truth is a lot of it is beyond the school's um, capacity to manage anyway. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, young children can't learn through distance learning anyway. Many children don't have access to high quality internet. Um, those are things that schools can't fix. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, Dan, why don't you add to that? Well, we, we begin with the fact that the schools were not designed to teach online. They were designed to be in a classroom face to face with a teacher. That's what uh, education is about. Mm -hmm. So uh, when this thing came along, the pandemic, pandemic came along and schools had to throw the switch to online learning, they were not prepared to do that. And the reality is that they have not been very effective in doing that. Uh, the other thing that it showed though was the huge inequity that exists in our public school system. Uh, the districts that were equipped were the wealthy suburban communities where already every child had a laptop, uh, where teachers had already been trained, where the software was available uh, for the schools to use. And so when they went to online learning, those students were perfectly capable to go home. They had the laptop, they had the internet access. Mm -hmm. The majority of school districts in America don't have that. Consider the fact that 54% of our public school students live in poverty. Okay. So a huge percentage of our students lived in homes that don't have internet access and attend school districts that don't have computers to give them. So currently, a huge portion of our student populations have received no instruction at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so as we think about going into this uh, school year with what seems to be uh, probably will be a blended model of some kids in schools while the rest of them are home and online learning, that problem continues and has yet to be resolved. Well, let me go back to you, Dr. Christakis, about what should the protocol be then if there is infection in the school? Will that be a trigger for these schools to close again? It's a really good question. I want to just add, I'll answer it. I just Please. want to add to what Dan said, because if we look at the single biggest best predictor of high school graduation, it's third grade reading levels. So if a child doesn't read at grade level at third grade, they're four times less likely to graduate than if they do. If a low-income child, as Dan said, most of the majority of children in public school are low-income, a low-income child who's not reading at grade level at, by age three is 13 times less likely to graduate. So this learning loss that's occurring in these young children is gonna be a real problem if we allow it to go on. Yeah, okay. The kids will need to come back to school, particularly primary school kids, because that's the only way they're gonna learn. And it's not a question of if, it's a question of when there will be an outbreak because there will be outbreaks. We know that, we can expect and plan for it. There are a lot of steps we can take to reduce the risk. And there are a lot of steps we can take to reduce the risk of it spreading once it does happen in school. Okay. Um, but uh, when there is an outbreak, clearly there'll need to be um, what's called contact tracing. So everyone that that child was exposed to will need to be uh, tested and followed. 
And one of the best strategies schools can deploy is to try to minimize the number of contacts that children have. So my suggestion would be, particularly for primary school, is that they take kind of the pod approach, right? Dan said correctly that you cannot expect kindergartners to social distance. That would make the kindergarten teacher's full-time job trying to keep kids apart and failing. Not only could you not do it, that's how children that age learn. They need to play with their peers. They will not get a meaningful experience if they're not hands-on with their peers. But what we can do to try to minimize the spread is to keep them within that classroom. So that becomes its own entity, its own family. And it'll minimize the risk of, of infection because kids will be exposed to fewer kids. And if there's an outbreak in classroom A, it's unlikely or less likely that it'll spread to classroom B or C or D. Okay, very interesting. I mean, Dan, do you agree with Dr. Christakis? Is that a plan that might be in the works for your membership to have these pods to keep one classroom's members away from other classroom members? Well, yeah, the, 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 the CDC guidelines already pretty much uh, indicate and that, that uh, students sh should be kept all in this, the, the same class. For example, okay. the biggest problem that that presents, it's not at the elementary grades, it's at the middle school and high school where students basically leave their classroom and move from class to class. And what they're recommending is that that doesn't happen, that they, can, they follow the elementary model and that mm -hmm. the high school kids remain in the same room and the teachers move around. Right. Uh, because that movement really uh, is conducive to infection as opposed to isolating them in the same room for the whole day. As a matter of fact, the suggestion even goes as far as saying the cafeterias should be open, the kids should eat in, in the classroom. So the idea is to contain them in that classroom with social spacing, where you have that six foot distance between them. Right, okay. Well, let me ask you about nurses. Should they be responsible for maybe administering COVID tests, taking temperatures? Um, you know, what is their role going to be like when the schools start up again? Well, I can tell you that legally in most uh, states and school districts, nurses are not allowed to do much in terms of medical practice. Mm -hmm. uh, they can't even give an aspirin uh, mm -hmm. unless uh, the students bring their medication with them and it's in the office and then the, the nurse can administer it. So in terms of doing a lot of these things, uh, that's a problem. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's one of the uh, issues that school districts are gonna have to deal with. If they're gonna need uh, health specialists in the building that can do these things, uh, it, it's got to, it has to go beyond what the nurse right now is allowed to do. Okay. Um, now, Dr. Christakis, um, also very alarming is data that shows that parents have hesitated to bring their kids in for well visits. Yes. So they may be behind on vaccinations that are so critical for their health. Will we start seeing a spike in diseases that are easily preventable by vaccinations? We could. Cough, yes. uh, whooping, uh, the whooping cough, mumps, measles. Yeah, we, we certainly could. Um, and I think that, again, you know, this is going to be important for when, when school resumes, that, uh, that schools enforce uh, the existing max required vaccinations. So there's, there's still time for children to get vaccinated over the summer before school starts. And we should absolutely not, not focus so much on one infectious disease that we lose track of these other ones that for which we do have very effective uh, vaccine. Mm -hmm. I mean, could that further complicate a reopening, Dan? No, I don't think so. Dr. Christophe, yeah. at that level. Keep in mind that most, that, that most vaccines that are administered to children happen well before school entry, right? So the ma majority of vaccines are happening in children under the age of three. Mm -hmm. So okay. it's not gonna be so much of a problem at school entry. Uh, would you agree with that, Dan? Yes, uh, uh, but it is, uh, it, it's the bigger problem really is with older children that are coming uh, because they've moved or they're coming from other countries and they have not had that record of vaccination. And then basically most school districts can't accept them until they do. Okay. Now, what do you think of the long-term impact uh, will be for children who are learning a lot about social distancing right now? But, you know, maybe not so much about the value of a handshake or hugging, um, positive phys physical contact. Let's start with you first on that, Dan. Yeah, well, that's a, that's, that definitely, 
I think one of the things that uh, people are finding it very hard to to accept uh, is that uh, there won't be a normal. There won't be going back to normal. Uh, things are changing and they will remain changed. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how long uh, if we ever go back to shaking hands and hugging, mm -hmm. uh, unless you're part of, of a family uh, or with friends that, uh, that you're close to and that you know. Uh, schools themselves, uh, as, as uh, much as remote learning uh, is a, a factor right now that it's not where it needs to be, I can guarantee you that remote learning will be how education will continue from here on in, mm -hmm. uh, even after uh, the coronavirus uh, pandemic is gone. So there are a lot of changes that are going to affect uh, how we behave uh, and our lives generally, yeah. and certainly school specifically. Yeah, um, please, Dr. Christakis, this is, you see kids all the time. You, you focus a lot on their mental health. Tell me what the long-term impact of this is going to be for kids uh, all through, the, through elementary school, middle school, high school. No. Well, it's, it's, it's hard to say the long term, right? Because no one has any experience with anything like this. Um, but the short term, um, we are seeing a rise in, in, in anxiety and depression in children of all ages. In China, they saw a 20 to 30% increase. Uh, they've seen it in Europe, and we're starting to see it in this country too. Um, those, those effects will be compounded the longer we keep kids in isolation. Keep in mind, we're, we're social animals. Uh, we didn't evolve for this kind of interaction with each other. Uh, you can see it in young children. An infant as young as six months of age will attend to another infant. They recognize them as one of them and they'll be fixated on them. They want to engage with them socially. So withholding all of that from children is, cause, is, is making them pay a price, at least in the short term. And I think that's the other thing that schools have to be prepared for. It's not just that when children return, they're gonna be behind in their learning. Uh, they will bring with them, I think, uh, increased mental health problems. And schools historically played a very important role in identifying at-risk children uh, and, and sounding the alarm. Um, and they're gonna be asked to do that for many more kids in the fall. Mm -hmm. do you, are you, Dan, talking about this with your membership, what to expect when they finally do see the kids again in the fall? Oh, absolutely. As a matter of fact, to the point that uh, we feel it's more important to deal uh, with the emotional needs of the students than necessarily their academic loss. Uh, the academic loss can be corrected with time, uh, but their emotional learning and, and the trauma that they have been undergoing, that's key. So we're working uh, for our teachers to be instructed and trained uh, in, in, in first, if not physically, emotionally embracing their students and, and letting them talk and letting them speak about their experiences and find out and give them the level of comfort that they will need uh, before jumping into uh, fixing the academic loss. Mm, okay, and finally, what can parents do to support students over the summer and maybe beyond if schools do not reopen? Well, uh, schools won't reopen in the summer. Every school district that I've heard so far is continuing with remote learning over the summer months. Uh, so many parents have uh, accepted uh, and done a pretty good job of, of be, being the parent in home. Uh, but, but they themselves, the parent themselves are, are talking about how frustrating it is and how difficult it is. Uh, but they, in essence, are going to have to continue in that role at least until the fall when schools actually reopen. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Christakis, do you have some guidelines for parents, some advice, if you will, yeah. on the language that they should use at home on maybe some reassuring um, activities or something like that that could help parents get them through the summer to get ready for the school months. Right, so, so obviously every part of this country is in a different stage of this pandemic now. Um, and actually like, for example, the state of Washington, different counties are in different stages. So I would urge parents to be mindful of what the current public health recommendations are for where they are in terms of how much contact is allowed outside of the home. And within, the, within what's allowable, take full advantage of every opportunity you can have to have your child socially engage in person with other kids. Um, we need to do sort of makeup play dates, if you will. There's a social learning deficit that needs to be closed. 
children are going to need more time outdoors with with playmates. If camps are open where you live, and some camps are open, many are closed, and you have the resource, I would I would try to make that available to your children, um, mm -hmm. and 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 uh, and support them through the summer as best you can. I I think Dan is exactly right that we should be attending to their emotional health as much as possible to get them ready to go back to school. All right, Dr. Dimitri Christakis of the Seattle Children's Research Institute, and also Dan Domenech, Executive Director at the School Superintendents Association. Thank you. Thank you to you both. Thanks for You're having welcome. Us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. And for more information on this and other health-related topics, Stay tuned to live.healthday.com. I'm Mabel Jong. Thanks for watching.